Hello, and welcome to the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast, where we explore the latest in life extension and anti-aging science with a dive into a month's worth of insights and new breakthroughs. This podcast is a combined effort of the Life Extension Advocacy Foundation, which operates Lifespan.io, and Future Grind, a podcast that explores the ethics and impact of emerging science and technology. I'm Ryan O'Shea, and I'll be your host. As rejuvenation research continues to grow and develop, so does Lifespan.io. This month's roundup features quite a few interesting studies, so let's dive in. Kicking things off with our research roundup, Parkinson's disease stems from the gradual depletion of dopaminergic neurons, a subset of neurons that reside in a small part of the brain called the substantia nigra. Now, a group of researchers, primarily based in India, have found success in priming stem cells to differentiate into dopaminergic neurons in rat brains. The compound used for priming is a cholesterol derivative known as 22-HC. Cholesterols are usually mentioned in the context of cardiovascular diseases, but as much as 25% of the body's total cholesterol is located in the brain, where it participates in the maturation and survival of dopaminergic neurons. The researchers used mesenchymal stem cells sourced from three human tissues, bone marrow, adipose tissue, and dental pulp. Soon after being treated with 22-HC, the mesenchymal stem cells began to strongly express several neuron-specific chemical markers. Moreover, their shapes became very neuron-like, with distinctive somas, axons, and neurites. 22-HC also increased the expression of transcription factors responsible for the maturation and survival of dopaminergic neurons. The stem cells taken from dental pulp showed the most neurogenerative potential. This study takes an important step by successfully creating functioning dopaminergic neurons and transplanting them into rat brains. Their positive results, combined with the pressing need to counter Parkinson's disease, mean that we might soon see clinical trials. Aging is accompanied by the loss of proteostasis, the accumulation of misfolded proteins in their amyloid aggregates, and mitochondrial dysfunction, which is partially characterized by the loss of mitochondrial homeostasis. Now, there is increasing evidence that there is significant crosstalk between these processes. A recent study published in Cell Reports shows how influencing one hallmark of aging can affect others. Deregulated nutrient sensing is another way in which we age. And this paper shows how NAD, an important molecule that regulates metabolism and declines with age, influences both proteostasis and mitochondrial homeostasis. The researchers' data suggests that NAD homeostasis is key in regulating age-related muscle amyloidosis. It also shows that increasing NAD levels ameliorates the accumulation of amyloid beta in aged human muscle cells, in old mice, and in a nematode model of amyloid beta accumulation. Boosting NAD levels also appear to boost mitochondrial function, moving it back towards homeostasis. It appeared to increase muscle homeostasis as well. The researchers provide evidence that ameliorating age-related amyloidosis also deals with mitochondrial dysfunction and that both may be addressed via approaches that boost NAD levels. From these studies, it appears that NAD is important in regulating metabolism and aging, which means that approaches to increase its presence to more youthful levels could be useful in treating age-related diseases. However, we should keep in mind that some circumstances can be studied in which higher NAD might contribute to senescence-induced inflammation. If we're going to stop or reverse aging, we're going to have to look at its causes and understand the complex interplay between them. Tackling only one thing will almost always be insufficiently effective. Instead, perhaps we should work to address several factors simultaneously. Here's a fun one. A review conducted by researchers at the Institute for Healthy Aging at University College London has determined that infestation of the gut microbiome by helminths a category of parasitic worm, may be a potential method of curbing the age-related inflammation known as inflammaging, thus delaying the onset of age-related diseases. The Western world has largely eradicated a great many parasites, helminths among them. 
However, as the review's authors explain, we did not evolve to live in a world without such parasites, and their absence can cause an imbalance of our microbiome. One of the downstream effects of such imbalance is immunological hyperactivity, which leads to immune-related disorders. In fact, one study in Argentina has shown that in patients with multiple sclerosis, parasite infection was associated with reduced severity of the disease. When the parasites were cleared, the disease got worse. The review's authors list multiple studies that have pointed to the glycoprotein ES62 as the causative agent in the helminth's effects against autoimmunity. The worms had evolved this protein to protect themselves against the human immune system, and the researchers hypothesized that we have co-evolved alongside the parasite, causing this protein to be beneficial in dampening overreactions of our own immune system. It's unlikely that many people want to be infested by parasitic intestinal worms, but it stands to reason that we should be able to isolate ES62 and administer it as a therapy instead. One mouse model of accelerated aging, brought about by a high-calorie diet, has shown that weekly administration of ES62 lengthened their lives by 12%. However, as the researchers warn, there may be unknown additional factors provided by the worms. This line of therapy is in its infancy, and needs to be explored much more thoroughly before we can come to any conclusions regarding its use and longevity. We have talked about the microbiome, the collective bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and viruses that live on and inside our bodies many times over the last few years. There has been increasing interest in the influence of this microbial community, especially those living in the gut, in the context of aging and disease. The gut microbiome is a complicated community of microbial life that constantly changes and shifts in response to diet, lifestyle, and other stimuli. Studies have shown that there is a great deal of crosstalk between the microbiome, the immune system, and other parts of the metabolism. Unfortunately, as we age, the microbiome changes with a tendency for beneficial bacteria to decline and harmful ones to increase. An increasing number of researchers are engaged in investigating those changes and countering them, but despite considerable progress in the last few years, understanding these changes is still a relatively new area of research and has yet to reach maturity. The authors of a recent review proposed to drive this young area of research forward and have proposed a new term, gerobiotics, to describe the bacteria that beneficially influence the aging processes to potentially slow, delay, or reverse some aspects of aging. The emergence of a gerobiotics field that seeks to identify pro-longevity bacteria and ways to reliably introduce them into our bodies would be quite welcome. That's it for our research roundup. For more information on these and other topics, you can visit lifespan.io forward slash roundup. New episodes of the Life Extend show have been released, including an episode that explores histones and how aging alters them. Here's a taste of that. Welcome to X10, your one-stop YouTube show for all things life extension. Learn the science, keep up with new research, and live longer and healthier. One epigenetic feature is a pattern of chemical modifications on DNA patterning proteins known as histones. In an earlier video in this series, we used books as an analogy for how our DNA is wrapped up in a package small enough to fit into our cells. Histones are like the pages of a book. Just as the text of a book is printed in lines across a page, DNA is wound around histones. Of course, the story isn't that simple. Histones can be modified by the addition of different chemical groups. The modifications are called things like methylation, acetylation, or phosphorylation, depending on which chemical group is added. Scientists also use more precise names to specify the histone altered by a modification, as well as where and what the modification was. One way to think about it is to imagine marking the page of a book in different ways. You might fold the corner or add a sticky note if it's a page you want to find easily. You might make notes about something in the margin. Or if you really don't like what's on a page and you're a bit weird, you could add a drop of glue so that it sticks to the previous page and can't be read easily. The chemical modifications of histones do similar things, changing how accessible the DNA is and affecting how it gets read. 
We don't really know the functions of all of the different modifications, but at least some of them seem to be linked with aging. For example, take the modification H4K16AC, which is the acetylation of lysine 16 of histone H4. This modification becomes more common as cells age, which leads to genes near it getting expressed more strongly. The H4K16AC modification is removed by one of the SIRT proteins, which are known to be involved in various aspects of aging. Boosting the level of this protein extended the lifespan of yeast, worms, and flies. But in other experiments with flies, knocking out a different gene that also removes H4K16AC shortened their lives. So once again, the picture isn't entirely clear. Another example is the modification H3T11PH, or phosphorylation of 30911 on histone H3. The levels of H3T11PH are regulated by the glucose levels from food, and in turn, H3T11PH regulates genes involved in nutritional response. Mutations that disable this modification increase the lifespan of yeast, though it's still unclear exactly what the link with aging is. The idea is that histone modifications integrate signals from environmental stimuli, such as diet or stress, in order to control gene expression. In other words, histone modifications are like a communication channel between the changing environment and the static genome. Aspects of our environment that affect aging, diet is a great example, do so in part by changing the pattern of histone modifications. This means that we could potentially increase our lifespan or health span by stopping those changes or finding other ways to control the histone modification pattern. Drugs that affect histone modification are one avenue, but other, easier tools are available now. Regulating diet and other lifestyle habits can affect your histones, changing how genes are expressed and lengthening your lifespan. Longevity isn't just about treatments to push up maximum lifespan. It's also about the changes you can already make to live longer and healthier. Another new episode explains a way to epigenetically reset cells using Yamanaka factors, putting them back into a pluripotent stem cell state. You can explore these and other episodes of the Life Extend show on their new standalone YouTube channel. Two new episodes of Science to Save the World have also been released. One episode focuses on geoengineering and how it may be possible to reflect more sunlight back into space in order to cool the planet. The other discusses the idea that memories, in some sense, may be passed between generations. Here's a short clip of that. For decades, scientists have debated the existence of engrams, the physical storage of memories in our brain. Intriguing recent research now reveals that ancestral memories may be inherited by offspring. Could traumatic memories inherited from our ancestors contribute to the rising incidence of mental illness? Nearly one in five Americans lives with some form of neuropsychiatric disorder, anxiety, depression, PTSD, etc. These disorders impose a significant burden on society. They can be debilitating for the afflicted and their loved ones, and treatment costs the U.S. hundreds of billions of dollars a year. Recent research in model organisms reveals that traumatic memories may be inherited across several generations and may predispose offspring to mental illness. Is this possible in humans? Could this knowledge give us a deeper understanding of ourselves and potentially even help to release people from the grasp of mental illness? Charles Darwin proposed the theory of natural selection, positing that inherited gene mutations provide offspring with a survival advantage in their environment. Around the same time, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck postulated that organisms could pass down acquired characteristics. He was ridiculed mercilessly. Acquired characteristics are biological changes that occur within an organism's lifetime due to use, disuse, or environmental effects. For example, resistance training causes muscle hypertrophy, an increase in muscle mass and strength. But you can't pass these traits down to your offspring, can you? Actually, studies show that exercise-induced benefits can be passed down to offspring. Not as larger muscles exactly, but as improved mitochondrial function or efficiency within the muscle. Memories are another form of acquired characteristic, a byproduct of our individual experiences interacting with the world around us. 
Acquiring particularly salient memories from our ancestors could help us know the challenges they faced in their environment and provide us with unique adaptations that ensure our own survival. For memories to be passed down, they first need to be stored as physical structures in the brain. If memories exist as physical remnants of experience, it is possible that they can be passed down to offspring. But this would require information stored in neurons to be transferred and encoded in germline, or sperm and egg cells. One lab found that transferring the RNA of sea slugs trained to respond to a gentle touch that was previously unknown to them could pass on this trained memory to other naive slugs. This suggests that RNA could be the signal that is used to transfer memories from neurons to germline. But how are these memories encoded and stored? Mounting evidence shows that epigenetic processes play a role in memory consolidation and help to transmit acquired memories across generations, especially when that memory is associated with a particularly salient experience, for example, one of trauma. To hear the rest of this episode, or the others in this series, you can subscribe to the Science to Save the World YouTube channel or visit our website at lifespan.io. Also on our website is a four-part series discussing takeaways from the recent third annual Longevity Therapeutic Summit, which brought together some of the biggest names translating longevity research into human patients. The team has also been working to put together our ethics code of longevity journalism, which has now been published on our website. We developed this ethics code to be a guide for all good faith actors in our community, as well as for ourselves. The ethics code will be an ever-evolving set of principles, and we plan to update it and improve it as new challenges arise. We also welcome your feedback and input. That's it for this episode of the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast. Thank you very much for spending another month with us, and for your help in the fight against age-related diseases. Whether you're donating, spreading the word, or simply listening to our content, we appreciate your help. Remember to subscribe, leave a review, and post about us on social media. This will increase our reach and introduce more people to the importance of life extension science. Don't forget, you can get additional deep dives into science, technology, and futurism on the Future Grind podcast. Find out more at futuregrind.org. Once again, I'm your host, Ryan O'Shea, and on behalf of the team at LEAF, we wanted to thank you for joining us. We hope to see you next time on the Rejuvenation Roundup Podcast. <laughs>